year, one and a quarter billion pounds is stolen from the NHS. That's money meant for doctors and nurses to run hospitals and to help us all when we fall ill. We're on the hunt with the crack teams of investigators. This is a huge theft on a grand scale. The treatment that he received hadn't happened. This is a fraud. Tracking down the fraudsters, stealing public money. They actually talk about, is what we're doing fraud? We are the villains, aren't we? Locking them up and getting the cash back where it belongs. Just under one and a half million pounds is going to be paid to some of the victims in our case. Just over £23,000 back into the public purse. The fraud squad is on the case. Today, a senior NHS employee with access to hundreds of thousands of pounds hatches up a shocking scam creating dodgy companies and even fake patients just to live a life of luxury. When we arrived, there were two large SUV vehicles on the driveway, both actually brand new. And one heartless man will stop at nothing to line his pockets, even if it means claiming the NHS pension of his dead aunt. And did you say she's not with you at the moment? No, she's been down to the club. Our first case is a scandalous abuse of public money. An NHS manager is trusted with a big budget, but instead of spending it with care, he cooks up a scam with his mates to line all their pockets to the tune of a quarter of a million pounds. Invoices paid for work never even started. Equipment sabotaged and replacements marked up by 300%. The NHS is used like their personal cash machine. Can you write me a cheque for £750 and I'll invoice the trust for £1,495. This shows them just clearly overcharging the trust, plucking figures out of the air almost, you know, it's just, just greed. Epsom and St Helier Hospital in Surrey. A heated argument breaks out in the car park. One man involved is trust employee Alan Hodge. Alan Hodge was employed as a technician at the hospital, and in that role he was responsible for the maintenance of dialysis equipment in the renal unit at the main hospital site and also in its satellite units. But he also had a responsibility for the installation and modification of dialysis equipment in patients' homes. A job that comes with a large amount of responsibility, not only for the smooth running of an important unit, but for its large budget. Because his responsibility involved procuring equipment, buying in equipment and buying in contractors to service that equipment, he had control over a budget at the hospital. After the altercation, Hodge is immediately suspended from work. While he's off, it's noticed that there's been a huge drop in the number of invoices coming into the department. They had a look at the invoices and realised that the work that was being invoiced, especially the maintenance work, was far too frequent. It looked like some of the items being charged for were excessive, the amounts charged were, were excessive, and some of the work appeared to be unnecessary as well. Concerned, they pick up the phone to the NHS counter-fraud investigators. A box of financial paperwork from the dialysis department is sent to Pat Dacey, a senior national counter-fraud investigator. The very first invoice he looks at reveals a disturbing discrepancy. One invoice was for installation of dialysis equipment at a patient's home when, in fact, the individual had never been a patient of the trust. The case quickly starts unravelling as more dodgy invoices are discovered. Another two invoices were for two other patients who were actually patients at the trust, but they received their treatment at the hospital. But this invoice was for installing equipment in their homes, which obviously didn't happen. There was an invoice for work that was carried out at Highdown Prison by Mains contractors. 
but when inquiries were taken up with, with the prison, they were told that Maine's contractors never actually visited the prison to undertake the work. So that set off more alarm bells with the trust. All the invoices have one thing in common. They've all been authorised by renal unit manager Alan Hodge. You could say that it would seem to be obvious that whilst he was there, there was a lot of work being procured. As soon as he'd gone, there wasn't. Pat looks at invoices for work that Hodge had procured going back as far as 2007. And the bulk of the business is given to just three companies. The first of those was a company called SJ Thompson Plumbing Limited. Uh, around about £134,000 of work was put that company's way, procured by Alan Hodge. The second company involved was a company called Mains Contractors, and Mains Contractors invoiced around uh, £388,000 worth of work. And then the, the last company was a company called TWS Southern Limited, and they were given about £43,000 of work. In total, the three companies had been paid over half a million pounds. But with Hodge suspended from the hospital, none of these companies are given any more business. Strangely, the renal unit finance office hears nothing from them. If you were a legitimate business supplying the trust and suddenly your business was cut off, you'd be on the phone immediately to say, well, why aren't we getting any more work from you? What was the problem? But none of these three companies did. It adds to the suspicion and it just adds to the fact that there are more questions here to be asked because clearly there's something wrong. Pat suspects that Hodge, over a six-year period, has conspired with the three companies to steal around £300,000 of NHS money. The police are called in and Hodge is arrested at home. Seeing people that are just completely freeze and they just completely non-communicative or just absolutely got no idea what's going on. I've seen other people having to be restrained by three or four police officers because uh, they have a very different reaction to what's going on. Hodge appears surprised but goes willingly to a nearby police station. When Alan Hodge was interviewed under caution, he declined to answer any questions and gave what's known as a no comment interview which basically means he said no comment to every question that was put to him. No comment interviews can be quite strange to deal with because it's a very abnormal situation to sit and ask somebody questions and them not to provide a response. You can't just sort of just turn the tapes off and leave the room. It's, you're going to have to ask all the questions anyway. Hodge is allowed home. But his mobile is confiscated and sent off to the counter-fraud forensics team. With no information forthcoming from Hodge, the investigation ramps up as another name comes under suspicion, Pierre Allen. Pierre Allen was a former business associate of Allen Hodge. Um, a pair of them had set up a company called London Holiday Dialysis Centre in 2006, uh, but that went into liquidation in 2010. As an NHS employee who's got control of a budget, uh, it's very important that you declare any uh, business links with any uh, outside organisations that could um, bid for work within the NHS. Uh, clearly, this is something that Alan Hodge had never done with uh, his previous relationship with Pierre Allen. And so once that fact was discovered, again, that sets alarm bells ringing. Alan is brought in for questioning to see if he can shed any light on the investigation. Alan and Hodge appear to be back in business. In interview, Pierre Allen said that he subcontracted a lot of the work out, and so checks were made by investigators on whether or not that was the case. And it was discovered that in most of the cases, the work actually hadn't been done at all. The investigation, having shown that a large number of these invoices were false, just brought home the dishonesty element of the investigation. Later, shocking and incriminating text messages between Hodge and Allen are discovered. They were deliberately sabotaging some of the equipment. So here we've got, Bill, what on the panel can I tweak to bugger the pump up? Pen 
pension scams against the NHS are one of the most common frauds investigators have to deal with. They cost the NHS around two and a half million pounds every year. Our next case is about a man who lies and cheats his way to claiming the NHS pension of his dead aunt. A six year long fraud. Blatant lies. She's come down to uh, club. And a phone call that gives the game away. As soon as he starts to speak, I recognise the voice. Bethnal Green in London. A man goes to the bank on the weekly trip to pick up his aunt's NHS pension. But unexpectedly, there's no money in the account. NHS pensions receive a call from the man. Good afternoon. How can I help? Oh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Miss Doris Baxter. Um, could you tell me if her payments have stopped? But first, the call handler needs to check that the man has the authority to call on behalf of his aunt. Can I state your name? Yeah, my name's Mr Anthony Briggs. Is she actually with you at the moment? Uh, no, she's gone to club. OK, and do you have power of attorney over her affairs? I do, yeah. You do, OK. Have you sent that in to us? Um, I did some time ago. He said he had a power of attorney in respect of his aunt, which wasn't the case. OK. We, do, we don't have any record of power of attorney. Um, and did you say she's not with you at the moment? No, she's come down to uh, club. So the way he's got around it is to say, well, she's at the club, uh, when she comes back, I'll, I'll sort it out and I'll get back in touch. Mr Briggs never gets back in touch, as his aunt actually passed away over six years ago. He's been fraudulently claiming her NHS pension ever since. He may have thought, you know, if I say nothing, lie low, then maybe I'll, I'll get away with it. But NHS counter-fraud investigator Stephen Headley is on his case. My suspicion was, here's a man who's committed fraud. Doing my job as an investigator, we have to take this forward. We have to prove our case, so I don't go in preconceived ideas. And as an investigator, what we're there to do is to establish the truth. Stephen begins by checking out the man who made the phone call. Anthony Briggs lived with his Aunt Doris for a number of years in a flat in the Bethnal Green area of London. Now, this man had access to Doris's bank account. Every week, he went down to his bank with withdrawal slips, allegedly signed by his aunt prior to her death. It was beginning to look like a well-planned and deliberate fraud. Stephen's next step is to gather evidence to back up his suspicions. In this case, what I did was go to NHS pensions, say, I need to know what are the pension rules, give me all the details of Doris Baxter, what forms have been submitted, what telephone calls have been made. The first thing what we've got to do is to prove that Doris Baxter died and that any pension payments made to her after her death should not have been uh, paid. And one document gives Stephen all he needs. So what we have first is here the death certificate of Doris Lillian Baxter. So it shows that she died on the 3rd of May 2007. It also shows that the informer to the death was Mr Anthony Michael Briggs. And actually it shows him living at the same address as her, which is significant. The next piece of evidence was the pension declaration document. What he's done is pretended to be his aunt, printed her name, signed it and dated it, and he's the witness to this signature. So there's an act of dishonesty. He's pretended that Doris has still been alive with the intent to carry on receiving her pension payments. At this point, he's the number one suspect. It's not as obvious as it sounds, because Stephen needs to make sure the real Anthony Briggs is the man behind the scam. He analyzes the recording of the phone call. 
Can I state your name? Yeah, my name's Mr Anthony Briggs. But is it actually Anthony Briggs, or is it someone pretending to be him? I tried to contact Mr Briggs. I verified where he was living, sent them letters, recorded delivery, none of them were answered. It was clear to me that he was just ignoring the letters. So then we have to progress it somehow. We can't just give up. Undeterred, Stephen calls for assistance from the police. And they head to the flat where Mr Briggs lives. The officers went to the door. He didn't initially answer. He was reluctant to come to the door. But then after some sort of repeated knocking, he did answer the door. Briggs is told to accompany them to the police station for questioning, but he has one final request. He was just about to take his dog out, so he had to let him take his dog for the walk before he brought him back. <laughs> Eventually, they make it to Bethnal Green Police Station. Briggs declines the right to legal representation, and the interview under caution begins. As soon as Briggs starts talking, Stephen knows he's got his man. I'd listened to the telephone recording to NHS pensions a few times. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Miss Doris Baxter. So I knew in my own mind what Mr Briggs sounded like. So in the interview room, when we did our introductions, as soon as he starts to speak, I recognise the voice. Could you tell me if uh, payments have stopped? That is the man that was on the telephone. He actually was very compliant, um, quite friendly. Whether at that point, initially, he thought he was perhaps going to talk his way out of whatever he'd done, that might have been going through his mind. Stephen starts to show evidence to Briggs. It's at this point everything changes. At that point, I remember it. In the interview, he just said, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. And then he went on to explain what he'd done. In total, Anthony Briggs stole nearly £13,000 from the NHS. Every week for six years, he went to the bank to withdraw money that should never have been his. Six years where he's had an opportunity to tell somebody and the bank where the pension payments were going in, he didn't tell the bank. So they thought Doris Baxter was still alive. He appears at Westminster Magistrates Court and pleads guilty to theft and fraud from the NHS. For that, he got a suspended prison sentence and also ordered to pay back over £8,000 in compensation. This isn't the first case of NHS pension fraud that Stephen has investigated. I'd like to say it was a unique case, but unfortunately, it's not. The NHS loses two and a half million pounds every year just to pension fraud. That's enough to fund thousands of GP appointments every year. So while each fraudster might think that they're not taking very much money, the overall impact on the NHS is significant. The investigators have a tough job tracking down the fraudsters, so why do they do it? I do this job because I love the investigating part of the role. Um, it's like a big puzzle, um, joining the dots, trying to find the solution, um, and then finding the evidence to back it up. Growing up, my dad has always called me Miss Marple. My motivation um, for doing the job that I do at the moment uh, is to try and ensure that the NHS is protected from losses to people who, frankly, amazingly, defraud it. Well, it's a very interesting job and it's different from day to day. Um, you know, you never know what you're going to encounter when you, uh, when you come to work. Sometimes really mad things happen and I had one bizarre case where, where I ended up taking a, a witness statement from a man who had a ventriloquist dummy sitting on his knee whilst my colleagues just laughed their socks off round the corner and left me to it. This next case is a carefully planned, perfectly executed fraud. It involves patients that don't exist, 
treatment that was never given, and nearly £150,000 being siphoned off into one man's personal bank account. An NHS employee has sole access to hundreds of thousands of pounds of hospital money. He's trusted to sign off and pay large invoices to private companies who are providing services to the NHS. He spots a way of getting his own hands on some of that cash. It's all so he could live in a posh house, drive posh cars, and send his children to posh schools. It all started when the finance director of a hospital in South London spots an invoice that looks dodgy. NHS counter-fraud investigators are called. The case lands on the desk of Melanie Alflat. I was contacted by the chief finance officer. I met with him and I met with the uh, financial accountant who had found uh, an invoice uh, rattling around their financial system that they weren't expecting to see. The invoice is from Choice and Independent Care Solutions, a company which provides specialist services and equipment for patients with learning disabilities, services that the NHS can't provide internally. But there's only one problem. The patient that it related to um, had been discharged. With money being claimed for work that couldn't have been carried out, Melanie starts her investigation by looking at the person who authorised the invoice, Senior Commissioner Noel Morrow. It's his job to contract private companies to provide these services to the NHS. His particular field is to ensure patients with learning disabilities get the support they need through what's called a care package. Noel Morrow would work with the local authority and if uh, an individual had health problems and they needed funding, he would agree the funding for that care package. Melanie discovers that in his role, Morrow has access to thousands of pounds. He could sign off invoices for payment for care packages up to £10,000. At the time the suspect invoice was sent, Morrow found himself in a unique position. He was working in a team, but uh, there was only two of them. One member had gone on maternity leave, so he was left in sole, with sole responsibility for that service that he was providing. Surely a man with such an important job couldn't be responsible for invoicing for services that were never provided. Melanie does some digging into Choice and Independent Care Solutions, the company responsible for sending the dodgy invoice. What she finds immediately starts alarm bells ringing. The registered address for Choice and Independence was Mr Morrow's residential address, so that gave us a link in to him there. The discovery doesn't sit well with Melanie. But that's not the only clue that suggests Morrow is up to something dodgy. When we looked in further, we found that there were connections to other members of his family as company secretary. With serious concerns that tens of thousands of pounds of NHS funds is being stolen, the finance officer looks back at her records to see if Morrow has authorised any other invoices. The findings are disturbing. She'd found quite a number of invoices had been received from this company that had been authorised by Noel Morrow. Believing they've stumbled across a serious fraud, the finance officers do a search of all invoices they received that have been authorised by Morrow, and they discover yet another clue. She also found another company that had invoiced the clinical commissioning group, uh, Blue Gale Limited. When we looked into Blue Gale, we found, again, that the company was registered to Noel Morrow's residential address. The case against Morrow is building. When we look at the directorships, the director is named as a Mr. Nolig McMurray. The address is the same residential address as Noel Morrow. The date of birth is exactly the same as Noel Morrow. And interestingly, so are the initials NM. We believe that Nolig McMurray is indeed Noel Morrow and just an attempt to disguise the directorship of the company that he'd been using to uh, send false invoices. 
and their next discovery is particularly troubling. One of the patients that he'd been invoicing for didn't exist. It was a ghost patient. There was a similar named patient, but that patient was female and this one was male. It was sent directly to Noel Morrow, who authorised it. Uh, it is for 28 days of care provided to a patient that we now know is the ghost patient at £289 per day, a total, including VAT, of £9,710, with the company's bank details and um, address on the bottom. Later, Melanie decides to pay Morrow a visit. Noel had already left for work. Fortunately, the police were able to stop him from getting on a train and arrest him. The investigators are clearly committed and dedicated to their jobs. But if they weren't fighting fraud, what would they be doing? Well, if I wasn't an investigator, I would probably still be working in media or arts because that's another side um, that I really enjoy and I'm interested in. I'd either like to be a lawyer, like a barrister, or I'd like to design knitwear. And of the two, I think, probably designing knitwear would shade it. I really quite fancy that. Probably something to do with sport, uh, involved in sort of uh, in football in, in some way, or um, you know, an administrator, something like that. I would be a very poor professional golfer. <laughs> Now to South London, where a hospital manager is under investigation for a quarter of a million pound fraud. He's been suspended from work while counter fraud investigator Pat Dacey looks into invoices for work that were never carried out. Alan Hodge and Pierre Allen were both arrested at home and they were brought here to Sutton Police Station where they were interviewed under caution by NHS investigators. And at that point, the investigation took a, a new turn. The data held on an individual's phone can be vitally important to an investigation. Data uncovered from Allen's and Hodge's phones makes interesting reading. There were a number of messages between Hodge and Allen in relation to monies being transferred, monies being invoiced. These ones here show where they uh, just doubled up on the invoices. So, for example, Hodge here texts Alan to say, I had to get a pump off Phil this morning for £900. I've just put an order in £1,595 to cover it. Further down here, uh, another one from Hodge to Alan. Uh, I've ordered the resin and charcoal from Phil. Can you write me a cheque for £750? And I'll invoice the trust for £1,495. This shows them just clearly overcharging the trust for, for the work that they were doing, plucking figures out of the air almost, you know. They've got an invoice for one amount and they've just doubled it. It's just, just greed. There was one exchange between Alan and Hodge in which Alan was uh, saying to Hodge that uh, Maine's contractors needed some more invoices uh, because they needed some more money. Uh, Hodge was asking, well, how much do you need? And Alan said, about 4,000, mate. So. Messages like that don't seem to be normal business messages between individuals. They seem to have a, a cavalier attitude towards NHS money, could you say? The data also introduces two more people into the murky mix of potential corruption. Following the examination of the phones and the analysis of the text messages, it soon became clear that there were more people involved in this fraud. One of those individuals was Steve Thompson, whose company SJ Thompson Plumbing Limited received a number of contracts from Epsom and St Helier. A further company that came uh, under suspicion uh, through the analysis of the text messages was a company called TWS Southern Limited, and that was a company which was operated by Philip Jones. With the extra companies, extra individuals getting involved, it's clearly becoming a, a more complex case. Once money was paid out from the trust into these companies' bank accounts, it was then a case of sharing it out between the four men. 
So here we've got Hodge and Alan um, messaging each other. Uh, Hodge says to Alan, uh, I've just done some invoices worth £4,000 posting tomorrow. Are you taking any more money out for us before you go to Switzerland? Uh, Alan replies, yeah, I think we should. How much do you think? And Hodge says to Alan, up to you, £1,000 each. This is important evidence in this case because it shows the links between the, the main parties and it shows the fact that there's a financial relationship between them. Another element of the fraud was where they were deliberately sabotaging uh, some of the equipment so they had to fix it more often, or they were using inferior materials when they were doing their repairs again, so they had to repair them more often. So we have a message from Hodge to Jones uh, where he says, Phil, what on the panel can I tweak to bugger the pump up? That's quite an obvious one. And then from Hodge to Alan, I've just had to change another pump at Mayday. It's burnt out, frozen, got one off Phil. Let's hope this weather keeps up. In that one, they've used some inferior materials which obviously don't operate at lower temperatures. So when the temperature outside is freezing, these materials are failing, therefore they need to replace them more often. So he's saying, let's hope this weather keeps up, i.e. let's get more business for us. These are just examples of them creating work where there, there isn't really any necessary. But it's some bank statements that reveal the telltale signs something's not right. There were a few items of expenditure within some of the accounts that we examined that raised the odd eyebrow, especially coming from a business account. There was £15,000 spent on Chelsea Football Club tickets, holidays at Butlins, overseas flights and overseas expenditure, a static caravan. Hodge is arrested for a second time. Again, he made uh, no comment, but he did provide a pre-prepared statement. He said that if there's any reference in any of my text messages between myself and Steve Thompson regarding an exchange of any money, that would be in relation to me renting out my caravan to him. <laughs> when, we, when we got up off the floor after laughing, no. I mean, how, you know, how, how are you going to investigate that? One says that they've given money to another for, for a random purpose, you see. Alan is also questioned again, but continues to deny any dishonesty. But a financial investigation is running alongside and is starting to piece together how the fraud works. Fraud investigations are never cut and dried because by its very nature, there's always deception going on, facts are hidden, monies are hidden, nothing is ever as it appears on the surface. And so uh, a lot of delving, a lot of digging is required before the true facts can emerge. Pat's perseverance pays off as he discovers text messages from a fifth person, potentially connected to the criminal gang, Alan Hodge's partner, Lisa Green. And so basically, Hodge is writing to Jones, uh, will you bring that check along tomorrow? And Jones asks, yes, who should we make it out to? And Hodge says, Lisa Green, cheers, mate. What these text messages indicate is that there is money which is coming from a criminal enterprise that is being paid into uh, Lisa Green's account. The bottom line is, if you allow your bank account to harbour money that you know is the proceeds of crime, then that's a money laundering offence. After an investigation lasting two years, Hodge, Allen, Thompson and Jones are charged with fraud offences. Lisa Green with money laundering. All of the defendants, apart from Philip Jones, entered not guilty pleas to the charges that were brought. Uh, Jones pleaded guilty at that point. The trial takes place at Croydon Crown Court. After seven weeks, the jury is ready to give its verdict. The jury found all of the defendants, apart from Philip Jones, uh, guilty of all the charges that were brought against them. And a couple of weeks later, they came back for sentencing. The mastermind behind the scam, Alan Hodge, gets a four-year sentence. Pierre Allen gets three years. And Steve Thompson, two years. As for Philip Jones, because he pleaded guilty, he receives a suspended sentence of 12 months. And Lisa Green gets a six-month suspended sentence and 100 hours of unpaid work.
The situation now is that five individuals were convicted of a fraud that the judge calculated to be around about £300,000. Pat is now working alongside the financial investigators at the NHS Counter Fraud Authority to try and get back as much of that huge amount of money as possible. It will then all be put back into the NHS. Confiscation proceedings have commenced under the Proceeds of Crime Act against all five individuals uh, for the return of that £300,000. Prior to 2002, criminals would see a prison sentence as a hazard of the job, so they could steal a million pounds, get sentenced for that theft, but come out of prison and enjoy their yacht or their villa overseas, etc. But since the introduction of the Proceeds of Crime Act, this gives law enforcement a number of powers to confiscate those proceeds. With the NHS losing more than £100 million every month to fraud, it's a huge dent in their budget. In South London, investigators are on the case of a manager they suspect of stealing thousands of pounds from the NHS and invoicing for patients that don't exist. And that man is Noel Morrow. Local counter-fraud authority investigator Melanie Alflat has discovered that two dodgy-looking companies that he created have been invoicing the NHS for work not done. To understand how it all links together, she creates a flowchart. What we did was we put Noel Morrow at the top and the address where all of the companies seem to link into, which is his residential address. And there's more. We looked at the VAT registration number and you'll see from these invoices that they're exactly the same, which is unheard of. So we then got the VAT registra registration numbers checked and found that they were false. Melanie and the finance officers are now questioning the legitimacy of all invoices from both Choice and Independent Care Solutions and Blue Gale Limited. This is an invoice from Blue Gale Limited. Uh, you can see it's come from Bromley and it's gone directly into Noel Melrose Workstream. Uh, what it relates to is um, a general kind of review of learning disability services, um, which is fairly broad and quite easy to disguise, a general review. So there's not really any way that we could validate that information. Um, the charge for eight days of review was £4,000. Um, the bank account details are contained here. When they add up the total paid out, it's a whopping £93,000. Tracking Morrow down is now a priority. But it won't be quite that easy. At the time, Noel Morrow had left and um, they couldn't contact him. Melanie needs to find Morrow to search his property. We contacted the police and asked for their assistance because it was our view that he had equipment in his home where he would uh, have been preparing those invoices. Search warrant in hand, they make their way to Morrow's home. I went with the police to Noel Morrow's house where we went to arrest him and search the property. Unfortunately, at the time of our arrival, Noel had already left for work. But he's not getting away that easy. Fortunately, the police were able to um, stop him from getting on a train, London bound, and arrest him then. After being read his rights on the station platform, Morrow is taken to a police station in Surrey. After his arrest, we searched the property and we seized a number of items, particularly computer items, anything that would have shown that he had developed these invoices. And they also discover a smoking gun. 
We found a lot of blank invoices and some invoices where mistakes have been made in the office. The search of Morrow's house also gives Melanie an idea of how he's been spending the money. We found that his children were attending high-end prep school. Uh, he was living in uh, a half million pound house uh, that we had found he'd rent he rented. Uh, when we arrived, there were two large SUV vehicles on the driveway, both actually uh, brand new, but they were leased. Although she knows Morrow has benefited from the fraud, Melanie needs proof. She sets out to find the evidence she needs. We found that he'd been provided through um, an agency, so we made a formal request to recover information that he had provided at the start of his um, employment with them. And what we found on a sheet of um, starter information was his bank details. And we found that the bank account that he used was also the same bank account that the fraudulent invoices had been paid into. The final piece of the puzzle. Confident of her case against Morrow, the time has come for Melanie to interview him. We were able to ask him questions about the invoices, about why he authorised the invoices, why he set the companies up on the ledger, what did he know about this patient that we know was didn't exist. During the interview, he elected to make no comment. But refusing to come clean does Morrow no favours. First, it goes to magistrate's court um, because um, that's the first port of call for any court case. But because of the seriousness of the offences and the value, it was referred to Croydon Crown Court. Morrow initially pleads not guilty, but following advice from his solicitor and facing overwhelming evidence, he has a change of heart. Noel Morrow paid back £93,600 before his sentence in hearing. He pleaded guilty at the final hearing and he was uh, sentenced to 23 months in prison. So I was really happy with the sentence. He was stealing from the NHS public money that's intended to be spent on patients and patient care, and uh, he stole it to fund his own um, greed. All these cases go to show that Anyone out there who thinks the NHS is an easy target had better think again. The Fraud Squad is on the case. It may not require the Fraud Squad, but there's some suspicious goings on with one patient in Leatherbridge later. Doctors is here at 1.45, and tonight on BBC One, being high-flying entrepreneurs is not always good for your health. Helping another family eat well for less at eight.